Chapter 2, Runaway Slaves Cush laid in his bed asleep, and he felt a tug in his spirit. As the darkness covers him, he hears a loud crowd cheering. Opening his eyes, he sees himself in the clouds. He descends towards earth and sees an elderly man marching in front of a military formation. The man marches alone, and behind him, there are eleven people. There were twenty people behind each of them. Behind each twenty, there were two hundred, and behind each group of two hundred, thousands of people were marching in a unified formation shaped like an enormous pyramid. He sees the great crowd cheering as the elderly man stops, breaks away from the formation, and walks onto a stage. About seventy-year-old, the man stands in front of a crowd. Tears roll from his eyes as he speaks. He hears the crowd, Sabaoth is mighty. Eustisahau. The crowd stood up and cheered again. The elderly man waves his hand for the crowd to sit, please, sit down. Never forget that we are all mighty warriors of Sabaoth. We're here today because Sabaoth has called us together to do his work. We are many clans, but today we are finally one people with one heart and on one accord. He paused, never forget to follow our hearts and not our flesh because our hearts brought us to where we are on this day and rejoice, for Sabaoth has brought us out of the darkness. Yes, and united us to fight for freedom, not the freedom of this world but the one to come and with great power the crowd roared as he continued, never did we know that something was hidden in us all these centuries, in our DNA, something not seen but felt within us, it can't be touched, but he can move mountains with it. The elderly took his hands and reached toward the sky, turning his hand into a fire. Kush's alarm went off, awakening him from sleep. He got dressed and rushed to Big Ma's house. Morning, Big Ma. Kush yelled out as he saw her watering her garden. Big Ma smiled as he approached, Morning, baby. How did you sleep? Kush smiled, I slept well, but I dreamed about my great-grandfather, at least, I think it was Wanyinyekavu. He was saying something about something. Don't you hate having a dream and can't remember it? Big Ma went in the house and grabbed something out of a drawer, speaking of DNA, I got yours somewhere here. I keep up with stuff like that. Here it is. After pulling out a manila folder, she started calling out different names, Jackie, John, Pig, and here we go, Kush. Big Ma took a seat and opened the folder, let's see now, you're 31%, Nigeria, 26%, Cameroon, Congo, and Western Bantu people. 10%, Senegal, 7%, Mali, 7%, Benin and Togo. 7%, Ireland, 5%, Norway, 5%, Scotland, 1% Southern Philippines. Which means you are Afroasiatic. As in, you have some ancestors who settled in Asia. The real Asians, not the modern admixtures. Anyway, 1%, England and Northwestern Europe, less than 1%, 3 Ivory Coast and Ghana, and less than 1%, Egyptian. Kush said, that sounds like a recipe for something. Hold on, less than 1%, Egyptian? Big Ma laughed. I'll get into that later, but you need to know that being a male, your DNA shows more of your father's side through the YT DNA or Y chromosome, whereas the female traces more of the mother's X chromosome. Big Ma placed the paper back in the folder and put it back in the drawer, anyways, about that dream of yours. You can tell me about your dream later if you remember it. Today is my birthday, as well as the Wada Sasa Kapumzika. Yesterday, I felt some kind of way. A feeling of loneliness and confusion. I have raised my children and a host of grand and great-grandchildren, and none come to visit except you. Kush felt Big Ma's sadness as he reached in his knapsack and handed her a gift, I'm sorry you feel this way, but this might cheer you up. Happy birthday. Kush said as a big smile lit up Big Ma's face. Rushing to open the present, she said, Oh, thank you, child. I love it. A tear fell from her eyes as she looked at the present. It was a hand-carved picture frame with a picture of Samuel, Big Ma, and himself taken years ago on her birthday. I hope you like it, it took me months to finish the frame, and I just wanted you to know. 
You are my everything. I never hung around people my age. What can I learn from them? All my grandparents have taught me since I was a child. Most my age want to do things that are worthless to me. I want to learn and be wise, just like y'all. You are my Philippa of Hainaut. My Charlotte of Mecklenburg Strelitz or Sophia Charlotte. Big Ma hugged Kush, thanks again, son, I love you for just being you. Kush wiped the tears from his eyes, how old are you, Big Ma? She jokingly said, old enough to know better and young enough to know that I don't want to know what I know. Now, come on in here, and let me fix us some breakfast. Big Ma's spirit was lifted as the two sat down, ate a big breakfast and talked for a bit before she put up the dishes and walked to the living room. Now, she leaned back in her husband's favorite chair. The ancient city of New Orleans had undergone a great transformation, it too was once a bubble city before many moved to the bubble city of New York or off-world. It had been abandoned for years. The only thing remaining from the actual ancient city was a few untouched islands. They were Marsh, Palmetto, Grand Isle, Breton, Chandela, Timbalier, Avery, Avoca, and Demorel's Island. But it was on the shore of Demorel's Island that Abuxigan, Bobo, and Dung were found unconscious by some runaway slaves. A twenty-year-old Somalian man named Shermake and a set of twins, Egyptian sisters named Akunsimbel and Akutikananu were eighteen years old. Bobo was awoken by them running and was growling at them. Quiet. One of the young ladies said as she shouted at Bobo. The woman's voice woke the two boys. She was covered in bruises as she and the other two runaways stood over the boys. Dung was afraid as he shouted to Abuxigan, she is going to kill us. Abuxigan looked at the runaways as he grabbed Bobo, quiet, Bobo. What's going on? Akunsimbel looked at his clothes, where's your village? We are hiding from our capturers for they can't be too far away. Rubbing his head, he looked around for Yael, we are from far away, and it would take a long time to get there. Akutakanana shouted, we must go, or they will take you as well, let's go. Dung and Abuxigan rushed off with the group as they ran, but the boys could not keep up. Abuxigan shouted, we cannot keep up with you guys. We will fight and show these fools who they are dealing with. Shermake looked at the boys and laughed, with what? Abuxigan got mad, with what? With the power and might of Sabaoth is with what? We have the power of Sabaoth behind us, and we fear no man. Dung looked at Abuxigan as he quickly translated what was being said. And Dung added, and the power of Sabaoth is all we need. Abuxigan repeated what Dung had said. Shermake looked at him and said, I have prayed to my ancestors, and of no avail, so you better bring your ass on before they catch up to us. Akunsimbel shouted, We have no time for this, come on. Akutakananu looked at Abuxigan as she noticed Abuxigan spoke to Dung and then looked at Akunsimbel and Shermake, We barely understand what Shermake says, let alone your friend. However, you even understand us. How is that? Abuxigan said, A gift from Sabaoth. Everyone understands me in their language when I speak, and I understand all languages and speak them. For Sabaoth's power enlightens us. My friend is Dung. He speaks Vietnamese, Shermake speaks Somali, and you too are Egyptian. Am I not, correct? Impressed, Akutakanana said, your friend, what is his gift? Abuxigan looked at Dung. You want to show them what Sabaoth has blessed you with? Dung transformed into a boulder, then a tree. The group was afraid, and Abuxigan said, Fear not, for Sabaoth will give you the same gifts. All you have to do is believe in him and have him as a friend, and these gifts and more, you will receive. Akutakanana said, I am truly impressed we have gifts and demons, too. Abuxigan said, You can't have both, for the two, they don't mix. Sabaoth's gifts are given without forgiveness. The devil cannot give gifts but will take those given gifts that Sabaoth give and use them for himself and against you. Sabaoth wants to use us for good, but the evil one confuses many, and they end up, sometimes, with a reprobate mind. 
Sabaoth gifts ends up being used by Satan. Akita Kananu had a confused look on her face, and Dung tried to ask Abuksigan what she was saying, but Abuksigan looked at Dung, we are in a hurry. I will explain it all later. If they are being chased, we must go with them. Shermake quickly said, yes, we have wasted enough time, let's be on our way. Abuksigan saw a cave ahead of them on a hill and said, let's go there, I have an idea, for we are great hunters and trackers. Let's leave tracks showing we swam to the mainland and hide in that cave until they passed. They will think we swam to the mainland, but we will go the opposite way and make it back home. With a look of embarrassment for Abuksigan, the cave? The cave will be the first place they look, said Akadakananu. With a smile on his face, Abuksigan said. Don't look that way at me. Have you so quickly forgotten his gifts? Dung will make the cave appear to be just the side of a rock, and they will walk around or ignore it. A Kunsan Bell's stomach growled, that sounds like a brilliant plan. But we need to find something to eat first. Abuksigan agreed, my father is from this place, and I know what we can eat, but we need to see if your capturers are close while we hunt for food and we. Dung quickly ran to the top of the hill and climbed a tree, it is clear as the eyes can see, shouted Dung. Abuksigan walked around showing the twins what was edible and what wasn't as he and Shermake hunted for food while Dung and Boo Boo watched over them. Hours later, they met up at the mouth of the cave. Abuksigan and Shermake had five squirrels and a rabbit. The twins gathered plenty of foxtail grass, cattails grass, and herbs. Once the cave was inspected, they all entered as Dung and Abuksigan used their weapons the best they could to clean the animals and start a fire. Abuksigan and Dung had a few items in their backpacks, they all enjoyed a splendid meal, and Shermake stood first watch. The following morning, the sisters were whispering amongst each other. A penny for your thoughts. I guess it can be said here, as. Well. It's something my parents say. Abuksigan said to the twins. This Sabaoth thing you talked about, what is it? He smiled, who? Sabaoth is the creator of us all. The one god that many gods have tried to duplicate. Men created these gods, but Sabaoth is the one true god for us all. Abuksigan explained but they were confused. Silence covered the cave for a moment, and suddenly Abuksigan started feeling happy and sad simultaneously as he began to sing to himself. Trying times brings us much frustration, such aggravation. Who understands our plight? Who can answer the questions why? It's troublesome. My misfortune. I'm not ashamed to say, sometimes it feels like I'm going crazy. After finishing the song, he wipes a tear from his eyes. Akita Kananu looked at him, what a beautiful song. Abuksigan smiled, it's my mother's favorite song, hold me, by an old group called Commissioned. Akita Kanana smiled, just beautiful, but we worship our ancestors, who guide us from evil. Why should we trust your God? You and your people have been fooled in this country for many centuries. You guys are ashamed of your natural hair and try to look like your oppressors, but your oppressors mimic your lifestyle and culture. You guys are just backward. Abuksigan looked at her, we honor our ancestors. We don't worship them. Plus, that was way back when we were people with no name, culture, or identity and were given surnames or government names because if we did know our clan or our real name, there would not be any American history. This government took control over our lives, and we were called Negroes, niggers, and later we took a curse and made it into a blessing by calling ourselves nigga. We learned our history and started using negus, spelled N-E-G-U-S pronounced Nagus, which means king, it's an Ethiopian Semitic language, a mixture of Italian, French, Greek, Arabic, and Spanish. Again, it took us 400 years to awaken out of our sleep. Other cultures saw it as well. It was once said by an Asian billionaire, when an Asian rises, all Asians rise. But when a black person rises, only that. Black person rises. So, I'm not offended by what you said or how you said it. 
I remember my father had us all watch a movie called Roots, a classic movie that depicted the life of the author's ancestors during slavery. It spotlighted the brutality and violent history of the transatlantic slave trade, rabid colonialism, and the sadistic mindset of the men and women who orchestrated the system and grew wealthy from it. A young Kunta Kinte tried to escape his captivity. He was hunted down and dragged back in chains and a yoked collar, like less than an animal. An animal would have fared better. Shermake got irritated, and Akunsimbel looked at Shermake as he walked away. A Buxigan wasn't concerned, I don't care who has a problem with me spreading knowledge because I feel the same way he feels toward people who live their lives in ignorance. Shermake heard a Buxigan, foolishness, you speak foolishness. A Buxigan shook his head. Seeing a ten-year-old boy turn into a boulder to close a cave is not proof of Sabaoth's mighty power, you tell me, what is foolish? Your disbelief or my belief? A Buxigan turned back toward the twins, as I was saying, Kunta Kinte was hung up on gallows by ropes, his shirt stripped off, and a gathering of all the slaves was called to watch. The motive for demanding them to see this sadistic act was part of making Wakatilians trauma-based, mind-controlled slaves. Kunta understood, on some level, what they were trying to do and tried to resist the efforts to break him. He had been taught in Africa that a lot was in a name. A child's future, destiny, success, individual power, and honor were defined in their parents' name at birth, particularly their mother's. Bloodline and generational continuity were dependent on a powerful name. The child was given two names, his public name, and the name attached to his soul and Spirit. The public one, all new. The private one, only the parents and creator, and their individualism and right of self-determination were in the name he was given. White slave traders made it their business to be acquainted with African traditions. Knowing the weaknesses and strengths of your captive and potential moneymaker was important. It was the key to remaking them into the model slave they wanted them to be. And so, they took the strongest and the most rebellious slaves, mainly males, who gave hope to the rest by their resistance and made examples of them. They took the best of us who resisted and broke them as you would a horse or mule. The idea was to show that the strongest of us could not protect the rest, and the best could only hope to use that skill to promote white collective power. Kunta and slaves like him who ran away threatened that power structure and wealth to white America. Kunta was brought back in chains to humiliate him. They drugged him through the mud to degrade him. He was hung before all to be made a spectacle of and beaten by one of his own, a divide-and-conquer strategy. The lashes from the leather whip produce unimaginable pain administered for the greatest torture effect. The loud crack of the whip struck flesh, leaving gaping wounds in its retreat. The screams of agony with each lash would forever leave an imprint in the minds and souls of all who watched. The sound of trauma resonates through time to be etched into future. Generations Consciousness and Genetic Memory The agony of the abuse left an imprint in the recipient's genes, whose children would one day manifest it in physical and emotional disorders they couldn't explain, behavior out of character, and self-loathing or aggressive reactions they couldn't explain. Far from the shores of his African homeland, Kunta remembered in his genetics the naming ceremony to seal his future by his mother Binta and his father Amaru Kinte of the clan Kinte. And so, he tried to hold on to the only thing of them he had left, his name. The only thing he could hope to pass on to his future generations. From Kunta Kinte's time till the present, there were many greats among us, both big and small, like Louis Farrakhan, Francis Marion Boyer, and Lucy Higgs Nichols, who have gotten us to where we are now. Ms. Nichols, born into slavery in Tennessee, escaped and served the 23rd Indiana Infantry Regiment as a nurse throughout the Civil War. After the war, she moved north with the veterans from her regiment to Indiana. When she applied for her pension, they had no record of her, being a slave, and they denied her retirement. Fifty-five surviving veterans of the 23rd Indiana Infantry Regiment petitioned Congress for her pension, which was granted. With many acts like these, slowly, we learned who and what we were, the true children of Israel. Do you know how often a white man was arrested and charged with murdering our people? 
If they did go to trial, an all-white jury would acquit them. The Klo Klux Klan threatened Francis Marion Boyer. A married man with a family attended Morehouse College and Fisk University and was a teacher in Georgia. While in college, he learned about the Southern Homestead Act of 1866 and its requirements. It allowed selling land for low prices so Southerners could afford the land, but only free blacks and white Unionists could buy it. Boyer's father was a Buffalo soldier during the Mexican-American War. As a child, he heard stories about vast lands in the New Mexico Territory free of persecution from whites, but the land was far away. Even though Boyer was free and educated, he didn't own transportation, so he walked to New Mexico. Boyer and another man named Dan Keyes packed small bags and walked from Georgia to New Mexico to start a new life. It took them almost a year to walk the 2,000 miles across the southern region of the United States. When Boyer arrived in New Mexico in 1900, he took a job as a cook on a chuck wagon, a ranch hand, and would send for his family a year later. They settled in a nearby neighborhood called Rosewell but started their own town, Black Dom. After three more years, Boyer and twelve other black homesteaders would create the Black Dom Townsite Company to create a self-sustaining community free of white persecution. Boyer and his family offered housing for newcomers and promoted free living for blacks. His family also made education a priority in the town. Black Dom established a church that was the home of the town's community school. And five years after that, Black Dom had become a famous black town with 300 residents, local businesses, and a newspaper. The town of Black Dom would find its growth stunted, but in the drought of 1916 and by the late 1920s, the city of Black Dom was no more. You see, it took us 400 years, from 1619 until 2019, to awaken out of our sleep. Sabaoth always cared for us, even when we didn't know we were his, but it took great pain and many deaths. But I am well aware of the great people of your history and Africa as a whole. Abuxigan felt he was talking too much, but telling people what he knew felt good. His family thought he hadn't listened, but he was proud of himself and wished his family was there to see him. I'm sorry, I'm just running off at the mouth. The twins shook their heads, a Bell insisted, no, go on. These were words Abuxigan had never heard before, and he got excited, I know about King Amenhotep and his temple of millions of years, but the most impressive king to me was Abu Bakari II, known as Abu Bakari and Abu Bakr II but I refer to him as Mansa Musa II, who once ruled the Mali Empire in West Africa. The force behind the African arrival to the Americas before that crook they call Columbus. Abu Bakari is said to be the son of Kalankan, sister of Sundiata Keita also known as Sanjata Keita and Sanjata Keita. The Founding Emperor of the Great Mali Empire in West Africa he gave up his throne to Mansa Musa I to pursue his belief that the Atlantic Ocean, similar to the River Niger, had another bank. Abu Bakari funded a 200-boat expedition to find the bank during his rule. When only one ship returned, the captain reporting that a current swept the rest of the fleet away, prompting him to turn back, Abu Bakari put together a 200-boat expedition he helmed. It is believed that Abu Bakari, who never returned home, landed at what is now Recife in Brazil and that some of his boats landed throughout the Americas, places like Mexico and Colorado. Many don't know that the tens of millions of black Americans, or so-called Indians, who disappeared did not all die in the Holocaust inflicted on them by America. They shipped hundreds of thousands to Europe and Africa as Indian slaves. Abuxigan paused, I don't like that word, Indians so I'll say, natives. You see, they gave us the whole slave trade story to all of us in reverse. They did not ship a mass colony of Africans from Africa to America. The truth is that many black natives were shipped from America to Europe, then shipped from Spain to Africa as a commodity for African resources. These black natives, now mistaken as African Americans, were sent back to America and classified as African slaves. The school systems fail to mention this part of our history. Dung looked at Abuxigan and said, You sound like your father. Abuxigan smiled and said, I am my father and my brother's keeper. 
As the books again continued, Linford D. Fisher of Brown University said that the Native American slavery was the piece of the history of slavery that has been skipped. Because between 1492 and 1880, somewhere between 2 and 5.5 million Native Americans were enslaved in the Americas in addition to the 12.5 million African slaves. They had forced natives into slavery and servitude as early as 1636. It was not until King Philip's War that natives were enslaved in large numbers. New England colonies routinely shipped Native Americans as slaves to Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica, the Azores, Spain, and Tangier in North Africa. The twins were intrigued by Abuxigan as he spoke confidently and confidently. Politely, a Akunsimbel said, let me show you what we can do, she pointed at a tree and let out a yell, and the tree began to shake. Akita Kananu joined in by holding her hands together and creating a small vortex, as clouds began to form above them but quickly dissipated away. Abuxigan saw what they could do but could tell they were not fully aware of their powers, impressive but let's fast tomorrow, and I will. Show you what Sabaoth can do. Do you believe? And they asked, will it help us believe? And he said, sure it will. Sure make, trying to sleep, overheard bits and pieces of their conversation. He became frustrated, why do I have to believe in this one god bullshit? Boo Boo growled at sure make, but Abuxigan grabbed him, quiet Boo Boo. And politely said, because when you only believe in yourself, you are filled with selfish desires. Offended, Shermake said, and what's wrong with that? Abuxigan continued, I will not answer that, but I will ask you. How many friends did you have, not associates, but friends? Shermake thought for a few minutes, if you put it like that, none. I'm a slave. Abuxigan, with a smile on his face, I will say nothing else. Seeing the smile on Abuxigan's face Shermake rudely said, Enough of this witchcraft and foolishness. I serve my ancestors, and this craziness must stop. Where is this place you call home, boy? Abuxigan didn't hear Shermake but thought about his sisters, Jayla and Anaya, calling him, Lil boy, he got mad, I come in peace, but to disrespect me one more time will be your last. If you don't believe or care not to listen, then say it in a way that doesn't disrespect me and make that the last time you call me boy. If you had just added another adjective to boy, I wouldn't know. Wise be saying this in the matter in which I am speaking now. Shermake was not expecting such a tone from him and apologized, I am sorry to have said something you dislike, but I've been up all night keeping watch, hungry, and would like to sleep in peace. A books again, looking at the young ladies, my father's hometown is in Tallulah, Louisiana just north of here. Maybe a week's walk or so from here. We can go there and be safe. Abuxigan calmed down and understood that Shermake had stayed up all night, and to be considerate, they walked outside and finished there. Conversation That morning, they all fasted except for Shermake. Abuxigan said, I am reminded of the prophecy of the prophetess, Akilah Malek saying, they refuse to listen to the truth but prefer error and lies. Like children, they turn their hearts to fables and myths that entertain and distract from reality. They say, the planet is dying a slow and painful death. From within. They told me future generations of children are being slaughtered in wars through scientific experiments and horrific abuse. Women, the planet's future, are under direct attack because they are its populators. The Plagues of the mind, body, and spirit have overrun the world, and there is little hope of saving it because man refuses to repent and embrace the true and living Creator. They said the Nephilim, the fallen ones of old in Genesis chapter 6 and the Book of Enoch, have returned in many ways through human surrogates. The betrayal of God and the ancestors who came before fought to preserve the truth for our generation. The children whose heritage and survival depended on our faithfulness to righteousness and justice. The laws of life have caused the soil of the earth and all its life forms to cry to heaven for help. An answer is coming soon. There will be storms, tsunamis of unprecedented strength, ice storms, firestorms, and volcanic activity. Earth will be shaken from one side to the other. Entire continents will disappear. 
Oceans will reel, and lightning will, they say, walk the earth as if alive, because of the altered electromagnetic channels under the earth. Everything is thrown entirely out of sync. The Church of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh or Holy Spirit, was meant to create portals over the earth where the power of God could be channeled to maintain a balance of communication between heaven and earth. But many of those channels have been corrupted and mutated spiritually. That is, it isn't God's voice and power many are hearing but that of the beast and his system. Reaching into his backpack, he took out his Torah, these are the words that keep us in Sabaoth grace, our guide, and our instructions for life. For centuries we have followed men and women who call themselves servants of Sabaoth because they fail to read it for themselves and trust the deceitful words of others. Both men and women are essential to Sabaoth, not just the men, and today we shall fast in what we call a holy jeûne to seek Sabaoth's face and grace. They read the Torah and prayed until noon. On the third day, the twins spoke in words he interpreted as, Holy, holy is his name, and they were enlightened. Abuxagan was excited and said, Enlightenment is finding or receiving your gift, but true enlightenment is mastering that gift. Seek Sabaoth, and he'll show you your gift and how to use it. As they praised Sabaoth, Dung saw a group of men coming in their direction, interrupting them, a group of men is going. Big Ma got up and walked around. Child, that's enough for today. I ain't sat down in one spot F.A. so long my ass done went to sleep. Your great-grandfather ruled over the land in Arizona with the twelve, many believed and were enlightened. But Tallulah lived without a ruler. Our rulers were our fathers or grandfathers, so we were governed on an individual family basis. It united us to a certain degree but many left who didn't understand or agree with Sabaoth's way when the people from Arizona came here. Regardless, if they had conflicts with the enemy, we had conflicts. 2. They are still our brothers and sisters. But I can say this, even if they disagreed, some of their children agreed and were enlightened. Anyways, child, come help me clean up before you head out. Big Ma grabbed call the dirty dishes as Kush ran some dishwater. He overheard Big Ma singing, trying times brings us much frustration, such aggravation. Who understands our plight? Who can answer the question's way? It's troublesome. My misfortune. I'm not ashamed to say, sometimes it feels like I'm going crazy. Kush laughed, go ahead, Big Ma. She just smiled, child, please. Now my favorite song is, A Change Is Gonna Come, by that boy Sam Cooke. Come, sing it with me. Big Ma dramatically sang, I was born by the river, in a little tent, and oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming. But I know a change gonna come. Kush jumped and said, Oh yes, it will. It's been too hard living. But I'm afraid to die. His singing impressed Big Ma because she had never heard Kush sing, and she let him finish the song and felt every word he sang, Boy, you can sing. Blushing, Kush said, Gone on, now, Big Ma.